Welcome to Pocus Geek. My name is Jared Marks, and in this video, I'm going to review a case with you in which a 30 year old female was driving at highway speeds, lost control of her vehicle, rolling it several times, and was ejected from the vehicle. ATLS protocols were followed, and she was noted to be hypotensive, and an EFAST was performed. EFAST stands for Extended Focused Assessment with Sonography for Trauma, in which we look and evaluate for free fluid in the thorax and in the abdomen and also around the pericardial sac. The images saved from this case will play over the next minute. If you need to, hit the pause button so you can review the images individually. At the end, you'll have a chance to formulate a plan and interpretation in your mind, and then I'll review those images with you step by step. Okay, so if you need to go back and look at those images again, there are some important findings there, and I would encourage you to um, try to find those if you can. If you haven't been able to do that or you want uh, to continue, I'm going to go over the images now, um, image by image, and just discuss about the important findings that we have on an eFAST exam. So when we go to our first image in the right upper quadrant, what we want to remember is that we always want to see the diaphragm down to the pericolic gutter. What this allows us to do is to evaluate the thorax for any free fluid and then also the intra-abdominal compartment or the intraperitoneal compartment. And so what we see here is I'm going to show your diaphragm right here. It comes like this. It ends right there. And then our spine comes like this and it's right along here. And what's important to know is that right at this point the diaphragm or the spine stops and disappears into the, into the diaphragm. If we saw the diaphragm continue above like this, then there would be pathology in this area. Now that could be free fluid, injured lung, consolidated lung, any of those things. But because at that point right here again, we lose track of the spine, it's highly unlikely that we'll have any pathology in this area. So let me take those off so you can see how that spine disappears. And so that's the first thing we're going to watch for. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to start paying attention to the paddle renal space right through here. And we're going to pay, pay attention for any free fluid in that area. And in these images, we don't see either. And so this is a normal appearing uh, initial view of the right upper quadrant. Now we want to image from the diaphragm down to the pericolic gutter. This is how we're going to do a thorough assessment of the area. And um, if we get down to that pericolic gutter, that's the actual most sensitive view uh, for the right upper quadrant. So we come to the next image, we look, and we're also going to fan back and forth, which we don't see in these still images. But we can still see the, the hepatorenal space right through here. And again, the kidney and liver right up next to each other without an anechoic stripe, so there's no pathology there. We come here, we start to see the tip of the liver, which is right here. And we can see this space right there for the per or the hepatorenal space, and there's no pathology there. This is actually concerning. Right at the tip of the liver, you got this area that looks like an anechoic structure, and we actually tried to take a couple of different images fanning through the area, and at that time did not determine it to be pathology, at least it did not appear to be. All right, so we're going to move on to a sub xiphoid view to evaluate for causes of hypotension. And what we're going to do is I'm going to put this video right here. And what we can see is liver up here, our right ventricle is kind of a triangle shape here, and then our left ventricle is back here. 
And what we're going to do is look at the liver and the right ventricle are essentially abutting up to each other. So there's no space and no anechoic structure between them. So it's unlikely that there's a pericardial effusion or uh, free fluid in the pericardial sac that it could cause compromise of the uh, function of the heart. And in addition, the left ventricle is pumping well. Now, keep in mind as you watch these images, this patient was uncooperative as she was intoxicated. So it's not easy to assess both of these things, but it does not appear that there's any pathology present. I'll let that play a little bit and we'll go to the next images. So as you can see, no free fluid between the right ventricle and the liver and that ejection fraction or the function of the LV appears to be normal. Left upper quadrant, what we have is again, our diaphragm is right here and the spine line comes in like this. And again, even though we see echoes in this area up here, right at this junction where they meet, the spine line disappears. You don't see the spine line continue up into this area. And because you don't, there's not unlikely to be pathology here. And again, that's important right at that spot, okay? So then the next thing is we're gonna take that off. And what we have is when we look at the, for free fluid in the left upper quadrant, we wanna look at the tips of the spleen right here and right here. And then actually track along here, along the diaphragm, just subdiaphragmatic, subdiaphra suprasplenic. Now we do have a rib shadow here, which limits it and can be difficult, but it does not appear that there's any free fluid at either pole of the spleen and that there doesn't seem to be any fluid tracking up along that uh, spleen that we can see. Now, again, we're going to also, even though it's unli or unlikely to have free fluid between the spleen and the kidney until that spleen is completely bathed, we're going to pay attention to this area. And again, we're going to do it until we see all the way down to the inferior tip of the spleen or kidney, whichever is most inferior. Just like on the right, we were looking for the inferior pull of the liver or kidney. So what we can see is it continues to be no free fluid in this area. There is a good interface between the two of those and we are not seeing any free fluid. And we finally see the inferior tip of this kidney right here. All right, so we're going to continue down into the pelvis, and what we're going to see here is we're going to start with her bladder right here. And we want to identify that. The probe marker is going to go towards the head, and we're going to identify our bladder first and then look for our uterus here. And what we want to do is look for free fluid back in this area. Now, in this case, we don't see it, but we got to remember that we're examining the whole pelvis and not just right behind the uterus. The uterus can move back and forth in the pelvis freely, and we need to make sure that there's not other free fluid. So you're going to fan with your probe back and forth through the pelvis. And what we see when we do this is that there is, again, our bladder here. And then we see some black areas out in here. And this is concerning for free fluid. Now, in a patient that is of menstruating age, as this woman was, she's in her uh, middle age, but still of reproductive age, physiologic fluid can be normal. Uh, this can be around the time of ovulation, and she's not able to provide any history. So this could be concerning for pathology or physiologic fluid. And what you don't want to do is send somebody to the OR that has other injuries that are causing her hypotension, their hypotension and then they sustain another injury from an open laparotomy. So it's important that you fan through and look at this. Now we can continue to see like this little area right here, up in here. That's all concerning for free fluid, but so far it looks like a minimal amount. So what we're gonna say in this is that this could be physiologic, it could be pathologic, and so right now our study is equivocal, meaning we can either call it positive or negative, but we should be having that discussion with the resuscitation team and trying to understand what can happen next. And that will come back to what we should do after this. I would continue your resuscitation during this time period uh, to make sure that you're giving that chance or that person a chance of improvement with your normal resuscitation. When we come to the lung views, this patient started to uh, say, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Um, it's important to be able to see the lungs and make sure that there's no pneumothorax in somebody with this high mechanism of injury. So what we're going to see here is that we have our lung or our pleural line right here, and that's where we're going to watch for lung sliding. And then right here, we have a rib, rib with rib shadow, another rib with rib shadow. And what we want to do is at this spot, at this pleural line, 
right here and right here, we want to see if there's any slung sliding. And it may look like uh, some people describe it as ants marching on a log. Um, others just say it kind of shimmers back and forth. But I'm going to let that play for you and let you see that uh, lung sliding that is occurring there. And so we see in this image that there's lung sliding. We're going to go to the next image. Again, the plural line is this bright line between those rib shadows. And again, we see lung sliding. We're going to go over to the left anterior thorax. Also, we can see that bright white plural line and see that it's sliding back and forth. And finally, the last image of the anterior lung. Now, we could have on all these lung images decreased our gain a little bit. That probably would have helped with image quality and be able to interpret that. So when we finish the FAST exam, we see that the patient continues to be hypotensive. In this particular case, um, you know, we considered there to be a high mechanism of injury, possible hemoperitoneum, so the choice to start blood was initiated. And then we've got to start thinking, okay, this could be positive. What are our other causes of uh, shock or hypotension in this patient? So when we look at this, cardiogenic could be, but we saw an image of the heart and it was pumping well. It appeared to have a normal ejection fraction, so unlikely. Hypovolemic clearly is a cause or it could be a cause. Anaphylactic and septic shock, not likely given her mechanism and her injury pattern, pattern and no other um, concerning findings, findings on the skin or otherwise. Neurogenic is definitely a possibility, but fortunately for her, she was still moving all of her extremities. She was writhing around in the bed. So that becomes less likely. So the question is, what do you do now? Well, you continue your resuscitation as you have, and then you give it some time. You continue that resuscitation. If she responds well, you can go about obtaining a CAT scan or whatever other interventions you need to do there at the bedside. But if they remain hypotensive, you need to give it about five to, or about 10 minutes, and then you should repeat the FAST exam. Not stalling on doing your other um, resuscitation efforts, but once you see this, what we start to see is when we look at the right upper quadrant again, now remember, we had this space that we were looking for free fluid, and we do have a rib shadow right here, coming down like this, which limits a little bit, but what we can see is right here at the tip of the liver, the pericolic gutter, there starts to be an anechoic structure. So when we come to the next, we can see it come right like this, and this is free fluid. This is hemoperitoneum because it's progressed, it's worsened. We see it again right there. So this is concerning and this is considered pathologic at this point. <clears throat> and it is important that you um, communicate this with whoever your surgeon is or if you're the surgeon. And the next option for her would be to go to the OR as she remained hypotensive and refractory to resuscitation. So this patient went to the OR from the trauma bay and was found to have a grad, grade 5 splenic injury uh, with hemoperitoneum and a grade 2 liver lack. Uh, she had to have a splenectomy and repair for uh, liver laceration. Now, the concern in this case, or the big teaching point, is that women can have physiologic fluid in the pelvis, and it is not pathologic. Now, fluid up in the right upper quadrant, you should consider pathologic because that's a large amount. A small amount of fluid in the pelvis could be physiologic. They have to be women of reproductive age. There is some data to say maybe this can happen in kids. Doesn't happen very often in guys, so if you see it in guys, you should consider it pathologic. But in this case, what keyed us in was this free fluid that we saw, again, right here, right here, and right here. And as we see this in the next images, we can see that those anechoic structures around the bowel, and that's concerning for free fluid. I hope you found this video educational for the use of EFAST in a refractory hypotensive trauma patient. Subscribe to this channel for more point of care ultrasound education content. You can also follow me on Twitter where I post and re or repost many ultrasound education tidbits under the name at Pocus Geek. Bye for now.